use policy. I, I heard him say at one time that because Singapore is small, we should invest overseas, invite overseas people to invest in Singapore, so that foreigners won't attack Singapore because their investments are here. You know, if somebody attacks Singapore, other foreigners' investments are here now. That's basically one use strategy, which is perhaps what make uh, the drive the whole of uh, thinking that we should be investing overseas and getting people to invest in Singapore. Is that a good strategy? Uh, my view is no. Uh, my view is we need within Singapore uh, a certain uh, economy uh, self-sustaining. Sustain, the argument that uh, Singapore is so small, we must always be export-oriented. We cannot have a domestic economy. Now that I disagree. I think we can have a, a, a domestic economy that can create uh, jobs for three quarters of the people that have one quarter depending on overseas demand. That, that would be, in my view, a better, uh, a better arrangement. The GIC's uh, annualized return for 20 years until March last year is 5.8% Dollar now, of course, it's quite meaningless because from March last year until now, the global equity markets have fallen by about 50%. So nobody knows. Uh, so the, the, I think the what's related to your question is, uh, had more investments been put in domestic SMEs, uh, would the return have been uh, better? I think to, to some extent, uh, investments have been made for higher return. Yeah, this yeah. is to make our economy more self-sufficient and self-sustainable. So basically, the uh, aspect of, instead of looking towards returns, uh, is to make our country more self-sufficient and sustainable, such that we can ride through a crisis like this. See, to some extent, there has been investment, but of course, uh, the argument is that too much of it has gone to government-linked government uh, companies. You know, so, I mean, it's very difficult question to answer on hindsight or going forward in the future. I think the key here is balance. If you, if you focus too much, if you diversify too much out of the Singapore economy, then you are more susceptible to a global crisis. But if you focus too much on your local domestic sector, which many countries have done historically, you could be worse off than what Singapore is today. So really, I think the question of, of balance. Um. I think regarding GICs and Tomasic's performance and whether they have actually done benefit to our local economy over the past few decades. Now that, that question I feel cannot be answered because GIC and Tomasic have not opened their books for us to scrutinize. And as long as we haven't held these two entities to account and they are not as transparent as we want them to be, then we will never be able to answer the question whether they are good stewards of the nation's wealth, whether they have invested our nation's wealth productively in, in areas that will help our own economy. So I think the first thing that we must address is this pressing issue of transparency in the accumulation and investment of our assets and reserves. Now, it is, it is of course my opinion that our reserves and the nation's wealth must be used to benefit the local economy. The next question that comes to mind is, is GIC and Tomasic the best entities to carry out that task? Why must it be GIC and Tomasic? Why must these two entities control so much, so many hundreds of billions of our nation's wealth in a way that is hard to account for. <coughs> they set their own investment mandates. They invest in whatever instruments they feel are invested in. At the end of the day, the citizens have no, have no way of influencing them. They don't take opinions from the citizens. And after in, in 2008, we find that Tamasic lost 31% um, GIC also lost a big deal of money and, and we ask 
Kodils have been prevented. Kodils have been prevented in, in a situation where citizens don't even have control over how their own reserves are accumulated. And, and these reserves, they don't belong to the government. They belong to the citizens. Because the reserves are obtained from the citizens without sweat, toil and tears. They belong to the citizens. So why is it that these two entities, GIC and Tamasic, have total control over them, over our assets? And they don't have to show us their books. They don't have to explain to us their investment strategy and so on. So with regards to the area in which uh, GIC and Tamasic have been invested in, they have been investing a lot in foreign, uh, foreign economies as well as the domestic economy. But as, as, as we can see, the, the investment in the foreign, in the, in the global economy is becoming so big that the current downturn has actually caused them to take a huge loss. So going forward, we must really question, uh, we must really demand that we have more control over their investment mandate. We must rethink our strategy of this. We must rethink the strategy of just something our hard-earned savings into uh, dubious financial institutions. And think more in terms of investing in, in more concrete stuff like agriculture, uh, green technology and so on. Now, the root of these problems is basically uh, the, way, the way our political system is structured. Uh, one party rule has granted the government too much power and autonomy so that they can control our reserves without being held to account. And this is the fundamental problem that we must address before we can talk about other issues like whether our investments are safe or what we should invest in. Now look, let, let's be very honest about this. Okay. You know if we know that if you control the economics, you control the politics as well. How many times have we come across people who see who, 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 who move us, come and join the opposition, either as a candidate or even just as, as a volunteer? The people then fear for their bread and butter, the jobs, right? That's the reality in Singapore. Lee Kuan Yew knows this. And that is why it's very important for them to concentrate their the, the, the economic system here in the hands of a few within the party. And that's the same thing for the media. That's the same thing for housing. You get the same few people who are controlling all the levers here in Singapore. So it's not hard to understand how, why the PAP actually does this. The question, the important question is that is this sustainable in the long run? When you've got a very top-down, top-heavy approach, as compared to, say, another model, say, the Taiwanese model, where truly the SMEs drive the economy. And I dare say that, in the long run, we are going to be less and less competitive. Because in this day and age, you need minds coming up you need to, to compete on innovation, on, on creativity, and this latest debacle with the, uh, uh, of our investments is just one question. This is just one example. You have very few people, and you don't even know who are the ones who made the decision. First, Shinkoff. Who made the decision to pump in U.S. $4 billion? No one knows. Who made the decision to plow in $6.9 billion US into UBS? Despite all the warning signals that have come out emanated from the banks. Put in under $10 billion. I'm sorry, sorry, $10 billion in UBS, $6.9 billion in, in uh, Citibank. Tomasic, putting in Merrill Lynch, Barclays. And we're not talking about the other uh, um, areas of investments, your, your real estate, it just plummeted. So you have a few individuals making those uh, uh, errors, and then they 
it gets magnified. You haven't diversified your losses. Is that sustainable? I'm trying to answer of what, what Joseph Chen is asking. That is a very, very dangerous proposition. EJ brought up this, this, matter, this matter of transparency. If you put all this wealth amassed in the hands of a few, what happens? I'll tell you this one thing right now. We haven't really gone in and, and re-examined the politics of it. You have hundreds of billions of dollars. Who signs the checks? Do you know? I don't. All right? Right now, everybody looks up, and you've spoken to some of the senior people who are, you know, within inner circles. It's a scary, scary scenario because everybody thinks of Lee Kuan Yew as God. I'm not exaggerating. Okay? The question is that when this God, God is not immortal, what happens? You get a vacuum there. You've got hundreds of billions sitting there. The next thing everybody will be thinking of is that the system is in place good, but if things start to rock, and they're saying, who's got access to these billions of dollars? What happens? You haven't. You haven't got any means at all to check them. Ask a Filipino. Today, today, they still haven't been able to trace and much less recover the billions that Marcos is. Because everything is covered up. When the day comes, let us not wake up one day and find everything gone. And this is where I keep saying, telling Singaporeans, we need to wake up. Because if we don't, just one fine day, just one fine day, we're going to see, we'll see everything go up in smoke and there's nothing left. I think you three have some question. <coughs> uh, my name is Chua. I believe uh, I made some comments in the previous SCP forums. Uh. Today I want to say something different. I hope the moderators will uh, give me the time. Uh, and I hope you will have the patience to hear me out. I will send both of comments. I hope to summarize what you people have said yes, regarding the accountability and transparency in the environment. You know, the longer I live in Singapore, the longer I feel I'm living in a monarchy rather than in a republic. The longer I feel I'm ruled by the emperor rather than governed by the parliamentary government. <laughs> How do I say that? You know, if these hundred billion losses does not entitle us to have a commission of inquiry, does not entitle us to have a parliamentary debate, can we call ourselves a citizen of Singapore? I doubt so. Only in a monarchy. The emperor can spend the money as and when they like without any accountability to the people. And worst of all, we have to swallow the words on the people who are responsible for the losses. You know, as, you know who said that? I don't have to refer, I don't have to mention the name. Or if I live in regret, I will lose very little. Of course, not your money. Right? So this is one point I want to make. We, the citizens of Singapore, we have to stand up and say that we are people, we are not state. First point. Second thing, for any institution, it lost 100 billion. The first thing, as a credible leadership, you'll come up to, to present to the people with a damage control action plan. You cannot sit down there and say, oh, this is for 10 years, 20 years, long term, never. By then, you will die, I will die, everybody, you will die. What's the point? Right? So, for any credible management, to lose that kind of money, you must come up with a damage control plan. But we hear nothing so far. It's, what we hear is long-term investment. They can either come and say, okay, I cut loss because there's an opportunity cost. You can use the money to do something else. If you're so confident, 10 years, you'll make the money back. Why don't you cut loss and invest now? You'll, you'll get a better return. Second, you may either want to take over the management and revamp the management so that you can make the company better and your return will be better. You know, or third thing, you might catch the position, you know, for those, uh, you know, financial gurus out there. But we hear nothing. Okay, third point. They say it's a long-term investment. But how about the, the, the compensation schemes of the people or the management in those two companies that are responsible for losses? When they make yearly return, I believe their bonus is based on yearly return. But when they lose, they say it's for long-term. So, how can you account for that? You see, just, just like in, in this, uh, you know, 
million dollars, you know what I mean? Huh? When they lose money, what do they say? Huh? They say it's, it's not my fault, you know? It, it, it's, a, it, it's a central bank fault, you know? They have allowed the interest rate to be too low. It's a government fault. So here we, we, we have to, you know, let somebody accountable for it. I think Singapore are too low south, too some mistake as well as Dr. Chi has said. I mean, I mean, I have a respect for Lee Kuan Yew, to be honest. I think uh, you, we cannot just ruin up that he has done nothing good for Singapore. He has his bad and his good. But I hope he doesn't see us as taking this fiasco as an opportunity to attack him personally. No, we want to learn from missing. We want accountability and we want transparency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you, uh, you talked about Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, the ex-president, the late C.D. Devan Naya, did advise him not to hang like an albatross around the neck of the you know, younger leaders. You know what's the albatross? Rhyme of the ancient arena, the poetry. Lee Kuan Yew is not a, you know, a literary person. Devan Naya is. But he has not taken the advice. So, but that's the reason why election in, election out, they try and divert issues by picking it. Petty things. Uh, Jubilee is back there in 1991. They termed him a Malay Chinese when he used the word Alhamdulillah and Tishakala. I think the trouble is we, we cannot rely on the equality is because uh, you know, the MP, the minister themselves are the famous slave of the master. You know why it's the famous slave of the master? If you are favored by the master, you know, you do whatever for the or if you are a favor state, you do whatever for the master. So, you know, this only perpetuates the Kwangyu's egoism. So, as Singaporean, I mean, you know, by standing here today, I'm taking the risk, as you people know. But as I say, I'm not attacking him personally, you know. We really must stand up and say, hey, come on, this is also our country. You know, we have a few generations living here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, go through the uh, British colonialism and go through the uh, Japanese occupation. The last thing we want to go through is the D monarchy, you know what I mean? So, we really have to face up to him. Thank you. Yeah, I was stressing they you know they always try to divert the you know voters' attention during you know elections by taking a petty issues. So you you know you don't concentrate on you know, the real issues. That's the problem here. So the people need to wake up again and come forward. Opposition, you know, here election in, election out, we face a lot of obstacles. Raising funds, you know, we have a lot of you know restrictions. Uh, we, we are signatories, you know, to the Universal Declaration of, you know, uh, human rights as a member of the United Nations. Uh, but people are afraid to speak up because of, you know, as, as we, we have in our website, our history, informing the Reform Party, we had problems. They, you know, potential uh, candidates for the future elections. They feel that they will be socially and economically ostracized if they get, you know, connected to opposition, you know, political society. The business community also is, you know, at fault. I had personally, you know, an encounter with an auditor. I did not approach him directly for clients. I'm a freelance accountant. Through a third party, uh, he approached me and he said that every time I mention your name to my clients, they are afraid that you will talk politics. <laughs> uh, I, I went to his office. I said, can you, can you elaborate? What do you mean by politics? Singapore politics? India politics? TNT politics? And another question, are you, do you, you know, ping uh, microphones on the labels of your, you know, staff to hear in on whether they are, you know, talking politics? He wouldn't answer me. And he's, he's a you know, prominent member of the Indian community. So, and he's a representative of the you know, professional circle. So, you know, we, what Dr. Ji has said, what Mr. Jaranam has been saying, we, you know, it is true. You, you, have, you have made a lot of points, but how many like you can make those points? Right? So that is the problem that we face, the stumbling block. I think, this uh, forthcoming election is an opportune moment for the opposition to you know, really cooperate, work together. And I believe I, I was in two successful election campaigns. One, 
in Hampstead, 1981. Second, in a major way in Hong Kong, 1991. I know the gimmick of, you know, changing people's minds. And I believe that, you know, we can break them in one constituency. Perhaps two. But we need the public to realize that there is nothing to fear. Even Lee Kuan Yew has, you know, has publicly declared that, you know, nobody will look at your, you know, the serial numbers of your votes and find out whether you are, you know, voting for which party or that. He's given his assurance. It was an answer to the late Dr. Lee Siu Cho uh, many years ago. So, you know, I, in this modern, you know, society in the 21st century, we are people who are still fearing. And, 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 and we are, you know, an educated society. How much can, you know, how much more we can need go on, you know, to... Sorry, I think fear, there's a real fear in Singapore. Yeah, you know, that, that is not a perceived fear. I mean, what the government has done to uh, General Rams, to Rams, to uh, Dr. G, we know that if you are outspoken, you know, you might be into something, you know, if it's not so, uh, you know, not, present, uh, not so pleasurable to you, you know. So I think fear is not something that we can just tell people it's only a perceived fear. No, it's a real fear. So if people who really you know, want to speak out, I think they also have to endure this, uh, you know, uh, suppression which might be, you know, imposed by the government in one way or another. Uh, we admire your, you know, your spirit, your courage. We hope many are like you in coming forward. <laughs> are there anyone with any other questions? So Jeffrey, I, I understand you wanted to make, you know, you wanted to raise a question. Uh, actually, I, I came just to listen, but after hearing some of the uh, questions, I, I moved to say something. Uh, first of all, What I can see now, how to spread the message among Singaporeans that uh, we need an alternative, uh, uh, alternative group of people with uh, sound ideas. I think many Singaporeans have got sound ideas, but uh, no platform for them to, because the media will not uh, bring up good ideas if it doesn't come from the PAP. So what I can see now is only. Uh, the internet, all right. But how do we publicize uh, the internet? Well, when I say publicize, I mean how do we make more people go into the internet? Like in the past, when uh, they have campaigns, uh, they have uh, campaigns behind buses and not saying that go to internet, go to SG politics, or go to the websites of the political parties. I think these things cost money. So uh, these are what some of the things that can be done, All right? Because we must uh, we must change the system and the non-transparency uh, of the GIC and the democracy. Because now we not only don't know what they are doing, where the money is put. We don't even know who the people who are running these organizations, All right? You know only the top ones. Uh, the lady who just stepped down, <laughs> you know her, but you don't know who, who the other people are within the, the circle. So Singaporeans shouldn't only ask for transparency of their actions, but we want to know who are the people who are running these organizations. Because we have a system in Singapore where you need to, when you want to withdraw 4.5, 4.9 billion dollars of the reserves, you have to get the president's approval. But you lose so much money, you don't need the approval of anybody. So this system has to change. So it's, it's what time. So, I mean, when they say reserves, are these two organizations managing our reserves? Do they need the president's permission to invest our reserves, if they are the reserves, in any business activity? So it's very funny, you know, Singaporeans have become the laughing stock of the world. 
You want to withdraw 4.9 billion, you have to have a big wayang. And the president himself has got to come out to explain, because I think he has read the internet. He got to explain why he gave the approval. He said, why I said yes. The question you should ask him is, can you say no? <laughs> you see, so, this is all a big wayang and Singaporeans are just sitting down as though nothing happened. So we must, we must find a solution. There is no other way for us except to involve ourselves in the alternative politics. Because organizations, other organizations, the PP has got a dumping ground for all its uh, candidates, the NPUC. You stand for elections, you leave uh, the civil service or other business organizations, they dump you in the NPUC. If you want post, because NPUC is a big organization involved in big business. That is also one reason why the GIC is not going to invest in Singapore. Because the NPUC is involved in so many businesses. So how do you overcome this? I, I can I spend a lot of time thinking about all these things. And Singaporeans, I would invite all Singaporeans to start thinking about all these things. How to make Singapore a better place. And Singapore must have trust of its neighbors because uh, I, I've brought this matter before some of the money that we have can be used to grow uh, for the agricultural like hus uh, animal husbandry and so on in our neighboring countries so that when the recession like we are facing now because we are putting our eggs all most of our too many eggs in, in, in one basket you know we must spread it out. We must trust our neighbors, lease land, cooperate with the neighbors, plant food. And if it's in excess of our requirement, we can even sell the food. Sell the food. So, I think one reason why is a siege mentality. Singapore is always afraid of being invaded, of being our investment in our neighboring countries are not as safe as investment in the western countries because uh, of this siege mentality. They are afraid that things go wrong, the investment will be nationalized, maybe. So we have to find solutions to this. Let's uh, stop the wayang. Alright, let's stop the wayang and get real. So I will call upon all Singaporeans, whoever you are, I think if today's session is put on the internet, wherever you are, whoever you are, if you have the interest of Singapore at heart, come and do your part. We have come to the extent of even coming here, standing here and say something is like taking a big risk. Which shouldn't be so, you know, we are not going to destroy Singapore. We are not a destructive force. We want to improve the future of Singapore, the life of Singapore, Singaporeans. So we must change this mindset. As long as you associate with the opposition and you go as smart as to come up here and ask a question, you are taking a big risk. So this mindset must be changed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's why we are known as the Reform Party. Thank you. Any other questions? We have till about 5.30. We can extend up to six even, but... I have one question I'll ask as a member of the floor. Uh, I hope Dr. Chi was here. Uh, my question is like building up on all the other questions that have been, uh, that has been coming forth from here. Uh, the question is, why should the Singaporean support the opposition parties because when you look at the opposition parties today, uh, there are some parties that are dormant who only come out to play politics during election time. Then there are other parties that are too confrontational for the taste of Singapore and. There are other yet uh, there are other parties that looks 
the same as PAP. So there's no difference between them and PAP. So why should Singaporeans come out and support these parties when you compare them with PAP, they seem to have done relatively well, over, uh, they seem to, quote, have a track record, they seem to, uh, seem to have opted in alternative views from different people. So what has the opposition has got to offer Singaporeans so that they would support the opposition? I know that this is a very difficult question, but somebody has got to ask this question, and this is the reality. Thank you. Uh, I, can I answer this first question? First of all, I'm Joseph. Okay, first of all, the diverse face of the opposition is an advantage. Because, no doubt, the Singapore Democratic Party has been criticised for taking a confrontational approach, but it is necessary. No revolution comes before pain. When we talk about fear and siege mentality, this is the reality. First of all, Singaporeans not only worry that their better sleep is known, there are laws that the ruling party could bring down before they can even blink their eye. One of them is the Internal Security Act, I say. <laughs> the second one, not very widely publicized, but a very sinister statutory provision. If you say to all those Chinese educated people, you will know. You just say 5-5. Five 5-5 five. Five five is a statutory provision in the Criminal Law Temporary Provision Act. Both acts allow the government to detain you without trial. Now let me tell you about the potency of 5-5. Five five. There's supposed to be a panel like you to review the lawfulness of the detention. But then anyway, how is it potent? The tribunal member is a senior lawyer and he goes to the court to attend to his own matters and he carries a bag of files of those who are detained under 55. And I had a conversation with him and said, okay, I can't talk to you for long. Because half an hour later, I will have to sit in a 5-5 session and I have not looked at the files. Then he opened his bag and showed me the files. <laughs> My God! The files, you know how thick that is, how many people are detained, is out to your knee. And this lawyer only has half an hour to look at the 5-5 files. And another law that will hit us real hard is defamation law. Now, one thing said about the case between SDP and the Minister Mentor as well as PM Lee is that one issue that is not addressed is freedom to information. Because if one reason why defamation is friendly is because of opaqueness. You make a remark, the plaintiff will call the defendant, support it, substantiate it with evidence. But where are you going to get the evidence when the plaintiff controls everything? <laughs> Today I go to NTUC, I point a finger at NTUC CEO and say, look, there's something wrong doing X, Y, Z. And I publicize the remarks. It's not a personal remark to the NTUC you ask me to substantiate it, if I can't substantiate it, I'll be sued. I will lose my home, I'll lose the hard earned money that I've accumulated in my savings. So this is the reality. You need SDP to be like in the First World War, to provide the first salary.
to get themselves shot so that the people behind the infantry men behind could move. Because coming to the second thing is that the opposition in terms of resources, like some economic questions are being brought up, we can't really discuss in depth. But that is to blame the two incumbent oppositions in the parliament. They have not developed a think tank. Much as we blame the ruling party for their poor investment decisions, their bad hindsight. But the two incumbent oppositions have to take a rep. Because until today, Dr. Mr. Chairman has probably said that he has been in parliament for two decades, but has seen formed an economic think tank to look at what the government is doing, yes, not. And if they don't have resources, why would I? My monthly income is not as high as uh, an incumbent opposition MP. We lack resources. That is the reality. And given the restrictions on raising funds and all that, it is a perpetual problem. And third thing is, like what Dr. Chi has said, you can't divide politics and economics. When I ask about why so much of our money is held by two big companies, the Marseille Holdings and GIC, why they are not doing enough to help local companies, I can give you a very concrete example. A lot of China Chinese, they come here to work. Some are workers, some are singers, some are waiters and waitresses. I ask them, they rent rooms which they have to share in one room with four or five people. I say, when you're off work, where are you going to find entertainment? Because things here are expensive for you to shop. Well, they have a laptop. They are savvy. Then I say, you don't even have access to TV. They say our local TV, Channel 5 and Channel 8, not worth watching. I say, no subscription SCP? No problem. They click on the internet. There are many, many internet providers providing them with entertainment channels. They can watch TV serials made by their China local productions. They can watch movies. All they need to do, to do is pay a fee. There are gamut of companies offering such services. So, what is happening? When, uh, when I was a school teacher, I sent out phone for what you would like to do in the future. Most answers came back and said that I would like to be an engineer, a teacher, a nurse. Come on, it's boring. And one guy wrote, hey, I want to start a media company. I want to be a media baron like Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> that kind of ambition we must foster in Singaporeans. Not saying if today someone wants to stand for a presidential election, we must foster that ambition. Not say you have to get the ad bringing endorsement from LKY in order or his selected elites to be a media baron. Rupert Murdoch doesn't need media baron. That is what we are faced with. And that is here, I'm here because I'm very happy that there is a seminar conducting a talk on very concrete issues, which basically the bottom line conclusion to me is that I already break away from the media. The country does not need them to run. The country does not need them to survive. There are alternatives. And we are capable of providing them. Notwithstanding all the handicaps that we face. I'm a lawyer, I fight for underdogs. And I do not care about handicaps. The more, the better. It makes me more resilient, more defiant, and it makes me speak more boldly. And that is the courage that all of you must here must have. Otherwise, if you are young, your future is washed out. If you are old, your children's future is washed out. Because I think a loss of 100 billion and more cannot be recovered unless our next gambit in the integrated resort pays off. It doesn't pay off, it will reset us back, and, and we have to wait for the next LKY. <laughs> no.
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I had campaigned for one of the opposition in Parliament, Dr. Kiang, in 1991. I worked in his town council for five years. Uh, I got disappointed in him. He wants to be a washdog of the system so they can, you know, comply with him. They compact, uh, Lee Kuan Yew compared him with uh, Mr. Jaratnam once, uh, saying that Mr. Jaratnam wants to destroy the system, while Lao is okay. He believes in the system. He only makes noise here and there. So, uh, I got disappointed in him. But that's the problem. So, uh, we agree with you, they have not, you know, formed the think tank, you know, they are only satisfied with uh, their own constituencies. I do not know about Bhutan Pasi in future because Mr. Chiam is, you know, he is ill. He's quite ill. I don't know whether he has, you know, uh, set up, uh, you know, someone to, you know, come come forward to, you know, take over this place. I do not know. And they have also not, uh, they are not willing to come for this forum. They invited them, or chairman invited them. They declined. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I want to make some remarks about uh, how to communicate through the internet. Now, the, whatever we write on the internet, first, uh, people must come to read, and second, they must believe you. So many of the things that are written in, in the internet the general public don't read and they don't believe. Now, uh, if we overcome and have some credibility and people read and they believe, it can be very powerful because uh, they, once they understand, they can go and talk to other people. But first, they must believe first. So what is our message? Now, uh, in my blog, I do get uh, right now 2,000 people coming every day. Of course, uh, the online citizen, I estimate about 10,000 people come. Uh, but reading is one thing. So, uh, now some of you will notice that I make good use of surveys. Now, what is a survey? A survey means a reader has a chance to participate. When a reader participates, then he starts to think and he also forms certain values. So, therefore, I find a survey to be a very useful mechanism for people to participate. Now, once they participate, they also become an owner of that idea. So that's why I, I put down just now in my paper, here are the results of 100 people. But the 100 people do represent a lot of other people thinking the same. These are not my ideas, but these are the ideas of a large number of people. But more important, when they read these are 100 people's ideas. Uh, they will think maybe it is more credible than just one person's idea. So the, uh, the survey mechanism is a very good way to give people a chance to participate, to educate and to disseminate. Uh, this morning I carried out, uh, yesterday and today, I carried out two surveys and I want to invite you to go and read the results of that survey. Uh, they are quite interesting because uh, the survey asks uh, if there is a general election in Singapore, who will you vote for and why? And I asked about 20 questions in two surveys. Uh, some of the findings are very, uh, even surprises me. Uh, one of them says, uh, one, one question is, uh, if the alternative party had credible candidates, 90% uh, of the people will vote for alternative. Only 10% will vote for the PAP. And I asked why. Uh, now, one of the things that surprises me was uh, what are the reasons to vote for the PAP? Some of the uh, things are we know stability, economic progress, and so on. Uh, but one of the things that shocked me was I like my MP. Nobody said that. Now, which means that somehow most people are not connected to their member of parliament. It was a very telling thing. Nobody will come and say, I like my MP. 
Uh, so uh, I also asked the question, uh, what are the reasons to vote for alternative candidates? Quite a number of reasons were given. Uh, so uh, I asked the question, uh, if you have an alternative candidate in your estate, you are going to suffer downgrading, no upgrading and other things. Are you willing to pay the price? 80% said yes. Now of course I do know that the people that participate in the survey are those not so happy people. So they don't represent all of Singapore, but they do represent a significant part of Singapore. So I will therefore like to encourage that uh, if we want to have a message that people believe in, they understand, they participate in it, uh, that the internet, the survey mechanism is a way, and some of the messages there are the results that they give to us are quite important. So I think, uh, uh, okay, there's also another question I asked, uh, very important. The first question I asked is if you have a good candidate from the alternative party, will you vote? 90% said yes, they will prefer to the PAP. The next question is uh, if the alternative candidate is not so articulate, not so well educated for you both, uh, 55% says no, 45% says yes. Now that means that uh, if Joseph and other people, lawyers, do come forward, the chance of actually getting good support uh, will be very high. That's, 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 my, that's, my, that's what I read from the survey. Uh, you can go and read the, the findings and make your own conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. I want to share your opinion too about this uh, candidate. I'm not, I'm not asking a question, but make some clarification. Right. Is that right? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Sin from uh, the Singapore People's Party. Uh, currently, I'm still the chairman of this party. And Chang Chi Tong, of course, is my secretary general. And I think you all know from the press and media that he is now sick. Now, of course, I have been in touch with him. Whether it's very sick or sick or whatever, to qualify, I think it's all up to you to speculate. But to make things clear, as I always say it, I live in a real, realistic world. This realistic world is all about actual things that you are doing. Now, I have been in politics for 22 years, alright? And I know Chiang also 22 years. I know Xiong also 22 years. So, what kind of people I am, whether I'm a credible candidate or a credible gentleman or whatever, really, over the year I say I don't really quite care. But I behave and do as what I do. What is things good, then I carry on. So, back to the SVP. Yes, we thank uh, your invitation. But I think you know that the present group of so called opposition parties in Singapore. Not only the PAP do live service, the opposition people itself also do live service. We say we want to unite, we want to this, we want to that, but in come to action, they are not really that united as you can imagine. Now there was one occasion where I met up with Tommy Cole uh, for a certain informal time. The first word he asked me is, why are you opposition so disunited? Yeah, I'm trying to unite them, but whether I can, it is within my capability to unite them, I don't know. But I'm still trying my very best after 22 years. So back to Mr. Chiang. In fact, 15, 20, 10, 15 years ago, we have already encouraged him to step up from Kodumase, to JIT, lead the GRC, and be more united with more people. But with his bad experience, Dr. Chi is not here with you know, and all that. So, okay, in my heart I say, look, I understand you, but Mr. Chen, you really have to be courageous to step up on Kolombase and lead the DRC. So, until today, which is about 15 years later, I think I read from newspaper the other day, he said, I am not going to quit soon, I will fight the GRC. So hopefully, let us pray that he will recover back to his 100% and lead the GRC. So this is what I can tell you about. Yes. Oh, yeah.
again I say, compensation or uh, lead services, I think I experienced myself where I have Mr. Ng Bixiong here and just now Steve Chia is here. I can tell you some of the very, very actual fact is I supposed to contest in Chachuga back in 97 2001 and I compete with Steve Chia internally, debate and everything, say, I'm a better candidate, but Steve Chia said, I'm a better candidate. So in the end, I give way. So I hope more cooperative spirit and actual action come forward from all among the organization. And I promise you that I will work along that direction. Whether I can achieve, whether I can get some result, I don't know. It's all up to, of course, ourselves, the opposition group, as well as all on the ground and the lawyer that just now you have spoken. Yes, sir. Uh, just, uh, where are you? Yes, it's over here. So do join us. Do join us to whatever extent that you can. Participating here, stand as candidate during election, join in for the campaign and all that. So let us have action. And I hope I have the opportunity and will achieve something soon in the near future. Now, I think they still know me very well. I'm a very liberal and open-minded person. And I'm optimistic about everything, but in Singapore politics, I'm not optimistic as well. At all. In fact, we are now in danger. And what I have faced most is we may extinct. So, really, let us go come. <laughs>